second uh, special segment of this presentation. Technical difficulties. Hello. Hello. Yeah. And for the second part of uh, this presentation, I'd like to bring on the uh, director of Brash Young Turks, uh, Naeem Mahmood. So give him a round of applause. Thanks very much. Okay, it's not working, but I'll continue anyway. Because can't let nothing stop me, you know, just like we made this film. We didn't let anything hold us back. Um, I'm not going to carry on too long because I don't have too much time. But uh, what I'd like to do is do a QA with the legend Julian Glover, who supported our project. I worked with him before as well, and he kind of um, helped resurrect my film career when I was down and out. And I thought it would be a nice chance to do a special Q&A with him, talk about the film, talk about his career, and anything else that you guys would like to talk about. So please welcome to the stage the man, Julian Glover. So is this one, okay. We might have a few technical difficulties because we don't have the proper projectionist up there, so here with us to play any clips and stuff, it might take a little time. Um, before we continue with the Q&A with the band, I just wanted to play a couple of deleted scenes from Brash Up Turks which feature Julian. Unfortunately, uh, due to political reasons that we had with sales agents and stuff and time, we had to cut it down and uh, we can talk about that more. For what reasons? For what reasons? Political reasons. Yes, it did get quite political and um, sales agents felt that it wasn't driving the story forward, what have you. But we can have a look now and uh, see the man at work. So, uh, why, could, was, uh, why was a little edgy from the film? <laughs> it's... And we'll open up the questions to the audience for, in just a couple of minutes. Quickly, Julian, I know that you're a big fan of theatre and you arguably prefer theatre over film. Um, why is that, if that is the case? It's not that I prefer theatre over film, it's that uh, theatre is usually more uh, on-the-spot rewarding. Uh, filming, as you know, is very technical and um, you have to think about all sorts of things apart from actually playing a part. Um, you know, if you're standing on the right mark, if you're in the light, uh, if you're standing up high enough or low enough or whatever, you would remember those things. Well, that's fine, it's not difficult. But it's not quite the same as actually playing someone in front of people like you, seeing their faces out there, and hoping that you've got something to say to them. Um, well, obviously, you're the instrument of the writer, um, but you hope that they, what the writer wrote you've understood and you're able to communicate it with you chaps out there and that's why uh, I know actors are trying to say this silly expression but that's my first love it's, it's, it's the theatre and I've been terribly lucky in that I've done a great deal of theatre well look at my face I've <laughs> been around a long time um, uh, but I've also managed to f fit in these amazing uh, big films uh, which have made me not into a star but into someone who's well known and that's a very nice a nice position to be in. I'm sort of recognised in the street uh, but not in an aggressive way um, people don't mob my front door thank God I happen to live next door to uh, Robert Pattinson yeah. I've known him since he was two days old and he has such a terrible time uh, with the public. Um, not that they're horrible to him, it's just he's mobbed all the time. Um, so I'm not going to tell you where I live, uh, uh, but he, because he doesn't have any trouble at home. Uh, but he has to, if he goes to the pub, he has to sort of take a private room at the back, and you know, it, it's dreadful. 
and I'm not like that. I'm someone who's well known, I hope respected, and uh, people seem to like me a bit. And um, uh, well, that's the theatre and film-wise. How? <laughs> How did you, um, did you have to audition for some of the major roles that you did, like Star Wars, Indiana Jones and Bond? How did you get those roles? And if you did audition, what was that process like? Uh, well, uh, I didn't have to audition for um, Star Wars because it was completely nepotistic. Um, <laughs> in the house, Robert lives in now, Robert Patterson, lived a man called Robert Watts at that time, and he was an associate producer, and he actually produced Indiana Jones later on. But he was produ he was the one who encouraged everyone to go on with Star Wars and uh, really persevere with it, make it work, because he was convinced it was going to work, he and George Lucas. And um, uh, because of, almost because of him, the Star Wars film started out. And I didn't have to audition for that, because I was, you know, wasn't much of a part, was it? Um, I just had to look nice in a, in a uniform and have a scene with Darth Vader. Was, oh, and a scene up in a sort of fighting machine, a fighting giraffe <laughs> a machine. Um, I did have to audition for Indiana Jones. Um, I went along and auditioned for the sergeant in it. Um, but I didn't have a horrible enough face, I'm glad to say. Um, so he got the picture on the poster, but I got the part of Donovan, which was rather better. <laughs> the Bond film, um, yes, I did, did have to audition for it, but I had to attend for it. I was doing a, a this is the sort of thing about the life of an actor, it can, it can go this way and that way and jump around and uh, you never know where you are really with it unless you actually hit the heights, like you're Harrison Ford or somebody. Um, I had had a terrible six months in the theatre, really terrible, we were thinking of selling the house and we certainly got rid of the car already, and uh, it, we were really on our skids. And suddenly, one day, I got a, quite a nice part in a, um, a biblical film with Anthony Hopkins in Athens. And uh, I was really pleased about that, and uh, it wasn't wonderful money, but it was, it was going to help us out. And on the day before the day before I was going to go out, there was a Screen Actors Guild strike in America, and the whole film was pulled. I was in despair, uh, of course, wouldn't you be? And my agent rang and said, oh, uh, yeah, there's something, I'm going on a Saturday morning, there's a sort of Greek thing happening. I want Greek thing. So it's a thing about Alexander the Great. It's not, not much, but it's, it's a bit, very, 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 John Cleese produced it, actually. And I went along on Saturday morning. You never go for interviews on Saturday morning. Um, so they must have been in despair to cast the part. And I got it. And I, it wasn't a very good film, it was Alexander the Great, nobody's ever seen it, I don't think. Very, very good cast, I have to say, but that's another matter. And I was out there doing that in Corfu, in um, Corinth, in Greece, when uh, this phone call came through from my agent to say, do you want to go on an audition or go and meet Cubby Broccoli? And I said, come on, look where I am, I'm in Greece. And he said, well, it's Sunday morning, could you get back? I said, no, I'm filming on a Saturday, come on. And he said, well, I'll, I'll try. So I went to the first assistant and said, can you adjust the schedule, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on the Saturday morning. And indeed, I did have to shoot on the Saturday morning. Um, but I got out, and I quickly got a taxi to Athens, and then I um, hadn't even taken my makeup off. And then I got a, a plane to Frankfurt, and another friend Train to, to, plane to London, and uh, I got there at about half past eight in the evening, and uh, staggered home, uh, cross-eyed, got up in the morning, went down to Grosvenor Square, where Cubby Broccoli lived, and there was, everybody was there, his wife, and who, who actually, I think, he, she cast it, all the films. Um, and they, the, the, the designer was there, the costume bloke was there, the makeup bloke was there, in this posh flat in Grosvenor Square, and I've been warned, I smoked in those days, I've been warned, don't smoke, so okay, I didn't smoke, and I did my audition, and um, not audition, an interview, and they were very nice, and then they went off, Cubby and his wife went off into a corner, no, into another room, I suppose to have a very large drink, and they came back, and the, the costume bloke said, you've got it, Julian. I said, how do you know? He said, I just know, I can tell from what she's, her face, and indeed, I got it. 
and I went back that evening back to back to Corinth and I started shooting on the Monday morning and that evening I bought the whole crew a drink <laughs> so <laughs> that was for your eyes only uh, which was a, a terrific adventure and the best thing about that was I was already in Corinth and we were filming um, in Greece uh, for your eyes only and so all I had to do was hop across the water and I got all my per diems and everything for about a month when I got this lovely brown envelope with money in it. I didn't know anything about money because of the tacky <laughs> film I'd be making. Uh, and I got there and it, then so, so suddenly my life completely changed. I was playing a villain in a Bond movie. I mean, good lord. The villain. A villain. Thank you very much. <laughs> And um, in uh, Indiana Jones, you worked with Sean Connery, Harrison Ford, and you said that they're very, very good actors. Um, and, you, and to add, you actually ran rings around them in that film as well, I remember very well. But what is it about them that was very good actors? What is it about them in the flesh? What is their technique? What is it about them that makes them really good actors, in your opinion? I don't know what makes a good actor. Um, someone who's got talent, and they think you, you, you don't know if you've got it or not. A lot of people think they've got it and they haven't. A lot of people don't think they've got it and they've got it. Um, so many people drop by the wayside who I think... I, I did a, uh, a, a much smaller film than yours um, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and this about old people, of course, and this wonderful woman came out uh, and played my wife and it, or an ex-wife. And um, I'd never heard of her before. And she was absolutely brilliant. Not only had she done all her homework, but she, she, the thing really came from inside her, and she was able to produce her eyes with the right expression. You know, the, the, you know what I mean about really good screen acting. So every time they took a close-up of her, oh, it was just simply wonderful. I've never heard from her since. I've never heard from her before. I met her only two days ago at uh, the Wars of the Roses at the. Um, at the Rose Theatre in Kingston, and she said, hello, I said, hello, what's happening to you? She said, oh, I don't know, I'm just getting on with my life. Um, so people can drop by the wayside, despite the fact being very talented. But when you work with people like Sean Connery and, um, um, uh, what's Harrison, his name, Harrison, Harrison. Ford, yeah. yes, 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 that <laughs> bloke, um, uh, and Denham Elliott, of course, uh, wonderful actor he was. Uh, you get inspiration from them. You, you, it, it comes off them. And you hope that if you're any good, they'll take a bit from you as well. And uh, thank you. And, and uh, a lot of very, very good work in it from, from all the actors. A lot of uh, uh, additional scenes have been filmed, haven't they? Yes. Uh, additional uh, sequences have been filmed uh, since I saw it last. And it's a, it's a far superior piece of work from the one I saw before. I, of course, have an opinion about the scenes that were cut. And I'm sure that um, the director and his brother and his mother and his sister and his father and his, <laughs> <laughs> and, business. And, and his lover and then, uh, all appreciate what I'm going to say. Those scenes were put in for a particular reason. And they were to show the compassion and humanity of that young man. That was the point of them. And the reason that she so deeply uh, loved him, far in a quite different way from her other love affair. And that, because he was a man of tremendous depth, a tremendous depth. And that the, I'm, I'm not allowing that poor old bugger uh, to buy that rubbish machinery was the beginning of it. And the fact that he followed up, he heard that he was ill, and he went to see him, and then he took him out for a meal, and uh, they had that lovely conversation. That was the reason for that. I have to say that I missed that element, not because I was in those sequences, um, but I missed that element of actually why she really got him in the pit of her stomach. Uh, so that's my opinion about that. I think they were lovely scenes. I completely understand why they were cut, but I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I love working with Julian because he's tough. <laughs> uh, Steve? 
First off, I must say, you're looking fantastic from, for, for someone who drank from the wrong cup of Christ. <laughs> um, what would you say is uh, the most strenuous film you've ever worked on? Shameless? Strenuous. 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 I thought it was shameless. I made a film called The Brute Punch about a wife beater. That's my most shameless film. Um, well, the film, I, I don't know quite how to answer that question. The film I most, in, most enjoyed doing of big films uh, was Indiana Jones. Um, you know, who wouldn't uh, with that cast and that director and all, all that money? And I was paid properly, my God. Oh, it was so wonderful to be paid properly. Um, of course, the, the government takes it away two years later, but uh, that's another matter. Um, Indiana Jones is the, is the one. It was a superb part. Uh, I very much enjoyed doing the Bond film, which had, had similarities with um, oh, the part. Had similarities with that one with Greek, and whatever it was, German, American, whatever. Um, in that they both started off being terribly nice. You thought they were both terribly nice. Uh, and turned out to be the villains after all. Um, but what was wonderful about the Bond film was that he was actually a, he was a good bloke. He'd worked for the resistance during the war and all that, and he had made his money. And he was now helping this young skater um, to, to win the Olympics. He hoped and all that. Uh, but he backed the wrong horse financially. And uh, this is what happened in Indiana Jones. Now I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen. What would you do for the secret of eternal life? <laughs> I mean that. Uh, he was right onto it. He was nearly there. And in fact, he was there, but he screwed up the last minute by being greedy. So always choose the plastic cup. <laughs> 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 That's the lesson of that film. <laughs> This brings me on to why uh, I hope I'm quite good at doing villains. I, I, ne I never consider the fact that they're villains. Um, I always have a reason for doing everything I'm doing. Even if I'm killing someone, there's a reason for doing it in order to achieve a certain objective which that person thinks all right. Even up here, the film you saw today, you saw, thank goodness, you saw the reasons that... Uh, the main baddies uh, were doing it. And I thought the, the tragedy of that boxer was absolutely awful. I mean, dreadful. Oh, God, dreadful. Um, that, that scene in the, in the garage uh, at the end, when he suddenly turned tail, and, and I mean, not turned tail, turned around and screamed and shouted and, and, and all that, and the girl was so confused, and, and uh, oh, God, it was, it was really dreadful. So that's the essence of making a good film, is that you understand why people do things, or that you don't approve of them necessarily, or you do approve of them. Uh, that for me is the, is the secret of it, and I think he caught that in this one. Thank you very much. And last but not least, you're going to be up for playing another villain in our next movie, doing what you do best. <laughs> Your next movie? You've got a part for a 90-year-old? We're going to roll back the years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm terribly lucky, aren't I? Here I am, I'm 80 years old, and I'm still working, I'm still standing, I'm, I'm still enjoying several glasses of wine every night. Cuts. And, and, uh, <laughs> cuts. Um, and uh, I am still working, I'm still in Game of Thrones, um, in the Series 6, and, um, uh, and I'm joining the Royal Shakespeare Company again at the end of the year to play John of Gaunt in Richard II and uh, we'll be playing at the Barbican in January and going to America to play it uh, in Brooklyn uh, in April. So I'm still knocking around. So if I'm spared, I will play the 90-year-old in your next movie. <laughs> you heard it there first. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Julian Glover.